Right, well, I think we will get kick-started because we've got a packed agenda for today. So welcome everyone to the Inner Source Commons Community Call for April. Um, we're really delighted that you've come to join us here today. Um, my name is Claire Dillon. I am part of the Marketing and Outreach Working Group in the Inner Source Commons. Um, and we had been discussing uh, after the last summit, and in fact, all the summits last year, uh, what to do for 2021. And one of the pieces of feedback that we continuously got in uh, after the last summits was that we needed more opportunities to chat and do Q&A. Uh, and we didn't really have time for that in, in the in the, uh, the fast summit pace that we had with the virtual summits for last year. So we decided this year that we would do more frequent meetings and choose particular themes so we can dig a little deeper and have some of these conversations that we really love having. So welcome today to the first one of our community calls uh, for April, uh, which is on the topic of metrics, value and ROI. And just to give you a little bit of an overview about what's going to happen today, we have two fabulous speakers, um, that being uh, Daniel Izquierdo from Bittergia and Joe Patrow from Bloomberg. Um, and both will be sharing with us some of their insights and experiences around this topic. Um, just to let you know that uh, the format for today's event is that we will have these uh, parts of the call recorded and we will share them with participants afterwards or people who couldn't make it here today. But the second part of the call, uh, so that'll be on for about a half an hour, and the second part of the call will be under Chatham House rules. So we will not be sharing the recording of the second part of the call, just, just for, so you know. Um, so as I said, First, first half of the call is going to be with Daniel and Joe, um, and second part of the call will be under uh, Chatham House rules, will be Q&A, and we'll have a discussion time then. So I will, at this point in time, stop sharing my slides and ask Daniel to uh, please share his slides, uh, as he will be the first speaker here today. So Daniel Esquierdo is the founder of Baturgia, and um, he's also a board member with the Inner Source Commons, uh, and we are delighted to have him here today. And we would ask Daniel to say hello. And now that we've got your slides up on screen, Daniel, take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Claire. Um, and it's an honor to be part of this discussion on the community call. And thank you all for joining uh, today's meeting to discuss about metrics, value, and, and ROI. Um, so uh, as Claire mentioned, my, my name is Daniel Izquierdo. I'm one of the founders of Viteria, I'm an active member of the, of the Inner Source Commons. Um, so let's let's start. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you, thank you again for for joining today. I, I hope we have like a, a great discussion, and um, of course we'll have later the uh, topic by Joe uh, discussing about Bloomberg and metrics and so on, which is uh, really interesting. So the first thing I would like to to share with you is this question. So what is the most important metric for you? Um, and if you think about this, uh, probably you start considering. Maybe, maybe the very first one, it's commit, right? Or maybe we can start about the pull request process, or maybe we can start thinking about uh, IT support and, and SLAs, or, or maybe we can think about uh, collaboration if we go to an inner source uh, environment of discussion. The thing is that we are now like 30 people, 40 people in the call. Um, probably there are like at least 20 metrics, right? So perhaps the question is not this one, the right one. But this one, what are the cultural goals that we are trying to achieve nowadays within, an, within our inner source journey? Because if we think about uh, the goals, then we'll discuss later how we can retrieve those metrics. But the point about uh, having metrics for the pleasure of having metrics is that this will lead to nowhere. Okay? So we first think, or we first need to think about these cultural goals, business goals, community goals that we are trying to to deal with in the following months. Perhaps we are at the very beginning of our inner source journey. So we think about, well, key concept of reusability, community collaboration, uh, building engagement across the development team and others. Uh, but for sure, within our business goals, we'll go and decide for one of them, one or two of them. So then we have our business goal, right? Um, and the thing is, how do we measure success? Because the question, here is that it's not clear, right? So, okay, we, we, we want to measure or we want to foster collaboration or we want to speed up the development process, but can we track that we are in the right path? Can we slightly move our direction into different ways? So then success means something else, okay? So, so this is part of the, of the discussion of, of today. And once we have success, we'll have these phases here, right? Yeah, we did it. 
we are we are in the in the right path here. So going back to the discussion of the of the of the cultural goal or business goals or so, for this um, part of the discussions we've had at the Inner Source Commons is the the goal question metric approach. So uh, this is a methodology used in, in software engineering for several years, and of course in in industry when when making things proper things, let's say. Um, and first, basically, it, it means that we need to define our goals, to fix our goals for the next uh, maybe six months, a year, a couple of years, and then this will be split into different questions. Okay? In this way, once we have the questions, then we can land those questions into several metrics, and perhaps we can reuse the same metric uh, here and there, or maybe we can reuse some of the questions to answer some of the specific goals. The thing is basically divide and conquer. And somehow, and, and this is this is the approach we we are following. Um, and of course, we need certain strategy on top of this, which is why we have the usual cycle, iterative process of uh, first plan and state your policies. And of course, when you are defining those policies, remember how you are measuring success for those policies. So maybe um, I don't know. The first thing we think is okay. Let's go for. Um, checking if there are bottlenecks in the in the code review process, if there's any code review process at all, because we just started. So we are not sure if our developers feel comfortable with this. Maybe there are blocking situations and so on. So we are now a new tool, which is perhaps, I don't know, GitHub or GitLab, Atlassian Stack, any other tool that you may have internally, Gerrit maybe. Um, and suddenly you realize that there are certain blockers here and there. So why is this happening, right? Um, are we faster than before in our pull request process? Because first remember that we, we are tracking metrics uh, on top of this because we would like to understand where we are and then we want to reach certain certain level, right? We want to improve either in collaboration, uh, code review process, in, in, in community engagement, in, in process review, et cetera, et cetera. So we have this strategy, which is first do the plan, then uh, do the, the action right, check if this, is, if this is currently working, and then if this is not working, act uh, 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 regarding to this. And if this is working, don't touch this because this is working, so then that's good. Um, of course, this is, this is kind of giving us this idea of the data strategy. Let's go with an example because we, we only have like a few minutes and then I would love to, to hear from you and, and questions and so on. Let's imagine we have the goal of fostering, uh, encouraging uh, collaboration. So we'd like to increase inner source projects engagement within the organization. So basically people collaborating with other people and so on. We have like three questions, we may have others. These three might be, okay, what are the projects and, and contributors or business units that are interacting with others or with other projects or, or who are the rock stars or who are those that are participating the most in each, each time there is a new technology or a new project, right? The second question might be related to a general trend uh, that my contributors are following across the different data sources. So this means what are the data sources that are the really low barriers here that are easy to, to participate, to, to send a message, right? So for instance, typically um, uh, uh, systems as uh, communication channels as Slack or Mattermost or any other tool like this, uh, real-time chats are kind of the easy thing. So probably you see that people are joining uh, those channels because those are, I don't know, trendy technologies, trendy projects, anything. But this is this is the very first step. Third question might be what path are my uh, contributors uh, following when getting involved with inner source projects? Um, and well, there are several proposed panels of, that we can discuss about. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the thing I mentioned before was that uh, I was talking about the question three, the question two. Uh, is related to the trend, if there is a positive trend, if there are people joining, or maybe there are people leaving the community, if there is certain retention rate for those newcomers joining, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for today, we'll focus on the first question uh, that will have a visualization, and then we'll work on the network analysis, which is a, a way to visualize and, 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 and check if things are, are working. So for this, let me bring into context the, um, the CNCF ecosystem. Well, indeed, CNCF ecosystem plus OpenSea, because this is based on, on, a, on a paper that we, uh, Diane Muller, had the pleasure to write with Diane Muller, director of community from Red Hat of OpenSea. Um, and that was uh, released in IOPS Software in 2019. So the thing here is that uh, each of the dots that you can see here are developers. So uh, uh, basically, each of these small dots that we, we see here are developers. And then the 
kind of the big stars right in the middle, there, there is like small blue square. Those are the projects. Okay? Um, if we think how uh, currently corporations work, um, we have isolated projects. So we would see like uh, one Kubernetes in one place. We would see Prometheus in another place. We would see Envoy in another place, FluentDB in another place. What happens in CNCF um, is that uh, we have a net between a dot and a blue uh, square. If there is at least one contribution from that developer into that project, and then it happens that there are developers that are working in more than one project. So we have this bunch of developers here working in Kubernetes, and they've been working in OpenSea at the same time. So they are contributing, they are collaborating with two different projects. Now let's imagine that each of these projects are different business units. So if we see what we have here in the middle, this is chaos, right? And this is what we'd like to be in our inner source journey at some point. We would like to see developers participating in different projects at the same time, no matter where, no matter what. Basically, we'd love to see this. We'd love to see this chaos because nowadays, our visualization chart, the network analysis of our community, of our internal development is, if we are starting our inner source journey, it's likely to be like isolated stars. So we'll see, we'll see projects mostly like Envoy, that by the way, the data is from 2019. So uh, things probably are, are totally different nowadays. Uh, but what we'll see probably is Envoy as an isolated project. And most of our projects in our inner source journey will be like this but we want to foster this, right? So this is a way we can measure this. Uh, of course, this is, this is like the visual approach. We can define KPIs, we can define metrics, we can go for things as newcomers joining uh, business units that are different from their usual business unit. We can go for the retention rate. So for how long are those newcomers contributing to our project? Projects perhaps with the highest number of developers working in other projects or developers, and we can think of certain concepts as centrality. So those that are bridging the community that are important, perhaps those that are right here in the middle, that if, if they are not there, those developers are kind of uh, killing the community. But if they exist, those are our, those are our MVPs, right? Probably uh, we can go for those really specialized developers working in one project, but doing a lot of uh, development there, or perhaps developers that are working here and there. So it means that they have like a, a really broad understanding of the whole inner source ecosystem that we have in the community, but they don't have a really specialized understanding of certain projects. Okay. Um, in any case, and to finish today's intro, uh, some call to action here. You have a metric strategy book that is under the inner source commons, uh, the summit sessions from previous, so there is a YouTube channel, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please join the discussion at innersourcecommons.org slash uh, Slack. Um, finally, the tooling we've been using uh, to produce the network analysis is under the Chaos Community, which is a Linux Foundation project. Open source is uh, chaos.community. Feel free to join the discussion there as well. Um, this is me. So if you have any question or so, we'll discuss about this after Joe. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much for that. Um, and now we will ask our second speaker for today, uh, Joe Patrow, to uh, come along and share his screen, please. Joe, if you can get busy sharing your slides, that'd be fabulous. And just to let you know you're on mute so you can come off that too, because we'll be expecting you to speak anytime now. And uh, Joe is the engineering manager at Bloomberg, and we're delighted to have him here. So Joe is going to give us a little bit more about what's been happening at Bloomberg and share a case study from them. We saw your slides there for a minute, Joe, but they've gone again now. Yep. Oh, um, yes. Can you guys hear me? We can indeed. Loud and clear. Off you go. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Daniel. Oh, good. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, good evening, I guess, depending or good night, depending on where you're dialing in from. Um, I'm Joe Patrao, uh, an engineering manager at Bloomberg, uh, and I lead the development of Bloomberg's uh, UI for its cross-asset trading systems product. I'm here to share my team's story on its InnerSource journey with you all. Um, so a bit about uh, what I'm gonna be discussing. I'll give a brief explanation on how InnerSourcing has exploded at Bloomberg over the last decade. Then I'll talk about the InnerSource project I've been involved in and where we are now. Um, I'll cover some changes that were needed to make the project more InnerSourceable. 
And I'll talk about how we use statistics within the governance model of the inner source project. And finally, I'll summarize some of our lessons learned and takeaways. So the last few years, inner sourcing has exploded across the engineering organization at Bloomberg. Uh, every team now is using BB GitHub, uh, almost every team, if not every team. We have technology guilds where engineers from across the organization build the relationships and share ideas. Uh, and these have created conditions that are very ripe for inner sourcing. Uh, we also started a special champs program, which bridges uh, the divide between engineers working in applications and engineers working on infrastructure. So this is an increased collaboration touch points, uh, knowledge sharing, and it's influenced product roadmaps across you know, various product and engineering organizations. So now more than ever, ever before, engineers across the company are empowered to be the change that they want to see in another team's code base, whether it's a simple bug fix that makes a client happy or an important feature uh, that improves productivity across a large group of engineers. Um, so contributing bug fixes and features is all good uh, to an infrastructure team. This has become quite routine. This practice, though, is still less common across application teams. So application team to application team inner sourcing is still not very common at Bloomberg. So a few years ago, I found myself in a situation where the success of my team was intrinsically tied to the inner sourceability of our project. So my team uh, owned a generic application and let's just call it team keep it generic. Um, uh, had so a piece of software that was potentially useful to many other teams. So not wanting to reinvent the wheel uh, there's another team, let's call them Keep Get, Team Get Stuff Done, with the backing of upper management, decided to invest time and energy in leveraging our software. Right, a no-brainer, right, a slam dunk. Uh, reality, however, had a bias, has a bias towards complexity. And soon, we ran into a, the big cheese problem. As our collaboration intensified, delays and disagreements on PRs frequently escalated uh, started from below me and they escalated frequently above me. Clearly our software development and collaborative practices did not support such intense inner source engagement. So do our, during, during my annual review a few years ago, I was told in no uncertain terms that as the manager of Keep It Genetic, this collaboration problem needed to be solved. The message was clear. There I was a few months into the role, not knowing where to begin, not knowing where to seek help, I couldn't even imagine what solving this problem looked like. So what do you do in this day and age when you don't know how to solve a problem? Rhetorical question, you Google. And that's how I stumbled upon the Inner Source Commons website and the literature. So I devoured the checklist, the getting started ebook benefited enormously from the uh, patterns um, and and slowly but surely my team began to develop a lingua franca around inner source concepts like trusted committer, passive documentation, contributing agreements. Now fast forward to today, where does our project stand? We have come a long way, even comparing ourselves to inner source intensive projects within the company. So uh, for illustrative purposes, I have a uh, project on the left, which is the traditional project where inner sourcing and a sample project where inner sourcing is not a focus within the company. Uh, the one in the center is my project. And the one on the right is software infrastructure where, you know, it's used by, in these are repositories or libraries used by hundreds, if not thousands of developers across the company. So these statistics tell me, uh, communicate that like, you know, we're doing a pretty good job uh, in terms of inner sourcing. A statistic that stands out is 70% of the PRs um, originate within the team. That is 30% of PRs come from outside the team with 16% with of PRs coming in from team get stuff done. So this is a marked improvement from where we started. But how did we get here? Uh, we needed changes in our leadership style. This was difficult. I needed to be more open and empathetic and and, and my entire team needed to be that way. And this was difficult. But once we were able to slowly progress down that path, uh, the rest followed like a snowball effect. So we, we, we lacked a common mission and a set of principles of software development across the inner source project itself. So 
with a more open and empathetic leadership style, which brought along leaders from team Get Stuff Done, we together agreed on a solid mission and a statement and a set of values. So we invested in asynchronous communication, adopted fully as much as we could. If it's not written down, it did not happen ethos. We, we started investing in our documentation and keeping it updated was a first class priority. Uh, we standardized our PR template, like automated a bunch of checks, uh, regardless of where the PR comes from. And slowly but surely, as we did this in partnership with the other teams, we started even more closely coordinating and planning our um, quarterly and, year and annual business deliverables. Uh, so together, now we then decided uh, to measure what made sense to measure. And uh, before we did that, we wanted to quantify how useful it would be if we solved this inner source you know, collaboration problem. How, what is the value? Um, and so before we invested significantly in attempting to improve every, anything, we examined the trend and impact of PRs originating from the team get stuff done. And so we asked ourselves how valuable it is to solve this problem. Uh, the graphs here are illustrative, but what they show, uh, they meant to illustrate is that team get stuff done contributed over time uh, consistently and their contributions mattered a great deal, both in terms of absolute number and in terms of their contributions as a percentage of overall contributions. There was some understandable fluctuation based on business priorities and quarterly planning priorities, but the overall picture was clear that there was significant value to be realized from improving, making INA source process more efficient. And we circulated some of this data with leadership across both their teams. Um, and this increased transparency and a sense of openness brought us all together in wanting to really invest and solve this problem. So then we focused in on our goal. We knew we wanted to measure and improve the collaboration between our teams from all perspectives, engineers, leaders, managers, product partners, but this is too vague and too cliche. We, had to, we decided to focus in and improve uh, and measure and improve specifically the timeliness of PR contributions that originated from team Get Stuff Done contributors. Now this followed, uh, this as you can see, follows a classic, almost like a goal question metric approach that the Daniel had already talked about earlier. Um, and so then we asked ourselves some questions. We wanted to know what the review distribution looked like. Um, how, where are pull requests being, uh, how many, what is the in intensity of reviews? Our reviewers, uh, our, our uh, engineers from within our team um, actively reviewing pull requests or are there bottlenecks in the process? Uh, what is the mean time to merge and how does this differentiate based on, differ based on where the pull request originated? And then we talked about whether we could provide some sort of SLA. So starting with uh, review distribution and PR engagement, we realized that like there were bottlenecks in the process. We had received anecdotal feedback bubbling up from Team Get Stuff Done that the review process uh, had bottlenecks and it was kind of centralized. Um, so when we looked at the data, uh, we saw that you know it, it kind of like bore those complaints true that not just in terms of reviewers, but also the number of engineers who commented and engaged on PRs and provided feedback, we saw that just a few engineers accounted for a large part of the PR process. Um, and so, you know, this perception of it being centralized and it being slow uh, was in fact somewhat of a reality. So we needed to change it and we discussed ways to improve it. And we looked at a bunch of factors. We stressed the importance of PRs, uh, reviews and feedback to the team uh, how that was central to the success of what we were trying to do. Uh, we tried to help by drafting clear guidelines and expectations around code standards. We added some more senior engineers into the team over the course of the last few years, and this helped significantly. Um, and just the attention to the problem and some of the things that I discussed, I think those are reasons why we are in a lot more decentralized and a better place now. Um, so then we looked at mean time to merge. 
So mean time to merge. Uh, so you can see like, you know, there are two columns, mean time to merge and standard deviation. Um, and team get stuff done actually has developers broke in North America and in Europe. So just looking at mean time to merge across the two teams, keep it generic and get stuff done. You see like the home team that's keep it generic, like has to wait like half the time for their PR to get merged in from when it's sent, then team gets stuff done. So this, this is current data and shows us it's still understandable that it's longer for the team gets stuff done to review it, but still twice as long, we still have work to do. Um, and then uh, we also looked at standard deviation because standard deviation is a good hallmark of the variability or the quality of a particular process. Um, and we wanted to examine the differences across geographical locations too. So you see your, Europe, team gets stuff done engineers in Europe have a much more reliable or predictable process uh, of uh, merging their PRs in than the teams in North America. And we were a bit confounded until we actually dug into some reasons for it. And, and, and the, the reasons are that like the, the, the European team has much more focused and strategic engagement which means that their projects are typically bigger. They tend to continue in phases over months working on the same big project. And then the North American team, which have many small and medium-sized projects and they are all over the place. So this is analogous to like all over the place in the code base. So this is analogous to the European team having like an economies of scale advantage because it's much more focused. It's in one area of the code base. It's a feature that will take a year to build or something like that. Uh, and so, uh, that, so then, you know, we could take some of the things we learned from the experience of the European team and and figure out like what was transportable to the North, to the North American team to improve and reduce their and make their process more predictable too. And the last bit we we looked at was whether we could provide an SLA. So imagine when you're at a train station and you're anxious to get board your train you see an indicator telling you trains arriving in five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, when you know that you're much at ease. We wanted to simulate a similar experience for somebody from outside our team who PR'd in, uh, giving them some predictability about when they can expect the PR to be merged in. So we tried to model this problem and, uh, and we tried to model this problem with like PRs, PRs, PR uh, attributes like number of changes in the PR, additions, deletions, size, uh, but we realized that a very small percent of the variability uh, of the merge times were explained by the variability of those PR statistics that we were trying to measure. So while providing an SLA was kind of a fool's errand, uh, given the data we analyzed, perhaps there could be a better, richer set of data that could give us a better model. Uh, well, that was a fool's errand. We did look that at like 90% of PRs in our code base are merged within 10 business days. So, so this is again, um, a statistic that we uh, didn't track prior to when we started this, but when we did, we were, and circulating this data kind of led engineers who were working with us to view us as reasonable uh, because like the anecdotal evidence tends to bubble up and escalate, but the overall picture tends is in reality a much kind of a smoother smoother one. Um, so then in sum, like what, what did we've learned so far with our through our through our engagement on inner sourcing uh, from within within application teams. So we use a data oriented approach to gauge the quality of collaborations by inner source collaboration looking at a few uh, I guess metrics. We realized that metrics were potentially important. Uh, paint only a part of the picture that they didn't they don't tell the whole story we definitely needed to change our culture may, needed to make it more open and inclusive and needed to provide uh, better tools to engineers to be productive in 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 the process um, documentation uh, level of difficulty of the problem being solved at uh, the sensitive nature of the change the available of the reviewers and the quality of the requirements gathering and planning process, uh, and the quality of architecture and brainstorming meetings and the CI CD pipeline were all crucial factors to a well oiled contribution process. And these are some of these intangibles are difficult to measure, but they reach important pillars. And while we don't have all our pillars in place, we are kind of building them step by step. 
So in this regard, keep it generic and team gets stuff done. Uh, we've made substantial progress together. There's still more work to be done, um, but we're very happy that we've made progress and we see a, like a bright future ahead. That being said, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. And uh, as you know, Bloomberg is always hiring. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to like chat with you guys uh, in the next 30 minutes.